when I came to Irvine and followed this simple decision-making process of finding a new dean, I started simply to, to observe some of these empirical things that, that people that were taking part in one meeting were absent in the next meeting. And there are new people coming that didn't take part in the first one. And some of the issues that were brought in the first time didn't have any speakers the next time. And there are new issues. So that, that, that you, you got the picture of a much more chaotic type of process. It's not a question of whether these were not rational actors or reasonable actors and so on. But it was much more on other other constraints, on, especially on their time, that the, suddenly they were on the East Coast rather than in California, and, and all these kind of things that made it necessary for us to have a much more contextual model of decision making. It wasn't so much the motivational side, but was more on the ability side. Whether, I mean, the, the, the rational model has very strong assumptions about the ability to make calculation, and even more so to implement them. Well, what we what we really did was to open up, to relax many of the standard assumptions in, in the traditional uh, literature on, on decision making. Some of them had been already with, with, uh, with the boundary rationality tradition, but that is more social psychology. It's more linked to what's going on in the head of people. Uh, but now we, we activated some of the other models of what, what do people do when they actually make the decision collectively from individual decision making to, to collective decision making. And, and what, the, what we could observe was partly this kind of random, the chance element uh, in addition to the choice, but also that they were using fairly simple routines. So there were, there were bits and pieces. Some of them were very much kind of routine type of things. Some were very much random type of things. And well, the whole process ended up with that the chair of the search committee became the new dean. So they had been searching all over the world and then they ended up with discovering their own search committee chair, which was kind of, of, of interesting. And it was also interesting to see, because I had, I had access to everybody, and it, this was after a while a conflictual decision a split. Uh, the economists didn't like the fact that you didn't have departments. So you, you, had, a, you had a very you had a very kind of special situation. And in that situation, it was a mix of a very strong leader, Jim, and an anarchy, kind of organized anarchy, as we, as we talk, that, that people could do whatever they wanted as long as they were within bounds of certain kind of things. But many of the young people were used to looking to the dean for, for science, especially now when they were choosing another dean. While, while Jim March had decided not to pick the new dean, he wasn't. But then when... It was the, the dean that would follow? Jim. Jim, huh? Yes, exactly. So he said, I won't be part of that. But they were looking to him, and when he didn't support a candidate coming in, they thought he was against it. So we had a discussion about that. Uh, Laura Nader, the sister of Ralph Nader, was one of those candidates that I knew had a majority, a strong, basically were supported by most people. But people misunderstood each other. And, and, uh, and uh, when Jim didn't say anything, they believed that he was against it. And I discovered how difficult it was to sit in a meeting and observe everything that was going on because people were nodding to each other and there were faces and all that that they made. Uh, so, so I got a lot of respect for, for the, the fine details of decision making and, and how, how the simple models of, of just making clear what the alternatives were and the consequences and then maximize it. Uh, even in that kind of setting, where you as could assume that many of them knew how a rational decision should be made, that was not what we observed. 